Okay, well, um, yeah, thank you, everybody. I can, the slide is a bit blinding, but it's good to see all, you all here. It's um, conference friendly weather. It's not so nice outside, so many of you are here, but thank you for coming. Um, it's my pleasure, actually, to introduce my colleague at Keisen University and good friend, um, Kyo Taka Takahashi. Um, his, his schedule, his um, abstract and bio, biography is, um, short biography is on page 35. But I'll just say a little bit about, um, we've worked together at Keisen University for about 25 years. And Keisen is a small women's university on the outskirts of Tokyo. Um, it um, started a graduate school of peace studies, which was the first in Japan. And um, Takashi Sensei is a very um, integral part of introducing a field study program, experiential learning program, taking uh, students to different parts of Asia. Um, he's just come back from Indonesia, so any Indonesians in the audience. And he's also taken students to Laos, Cambodia, Thailand. Um, and that's a big part of his contribution to KSN. And KSN has been a kind of pioneer of that kind of education in um, international development in Japan. Um, many other universities have kind of followed that, that lead of the, those kind of programs. Um, Takashi Sensei's university days were studying physics. I'm not sure how that contributed to where he is at the moment, but at um, Sofia University, which is not very far from here, but one of the top private um, universities in Japan. Um, at the time, I think one of the very, very few universities who had English as a medium of instruction um, program. And now there are many, many more. Um, but after that, he went to Manchester University to study um, social anthropology and came back and started doing different things. Uh, but his focus in the last 25 years has been education. Um, and he's, I'm not sure if activist is the best word, but he's been very active um, in sort of civil society NGOs, um, working with uh, kind of government policy or government funding and how grassroots people um, in Japan kind of use that or um, put government policy into practice. Um, and throughout, he's, he's traveled a lot. Um, much more than me. Um, I used to be proud of the places I'd been. I'd really talked to um, all over the world, Africa and, and many places. He's been very active in getting involved in community level, grassroots level, um, international development. So please welcome um, Kiel. <laughs> Dr. Shibo Sensei, thank you very much for your kind introduction. Um, I think it's uh, too kind for me. But anyway, um, I have to start with uh, confessing a little bit. Um, I'm feeling a little bit uh, a stranger here or alienated because uh, I'm not a native English speaker. And so I cannot make a live presentation what uh, my previous presenter did. But And also... Uh, Today's my topic is is about uh, development and the international uh, diplomacy. So it's a little bit uh, different from the other topics of yesterday and today. So and also I cannot make a live present representation like what uh, other presenter did. So please apologize. Uh, it's my presentation will be a little bit boring because. Uh, I have prepared a paper and I, I have to read it. So just allow me to do this. Um, okay. And I, I just got the eye surgery last week, so I feel uh, I cannot get eyesight at this moment. So anyway. <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, first, firstly, I would like to say thank you for all for giving me this opportunity to give my presentation today. And particularly, I'd like to express my gratitude to those who prepared this event and being patient with my slow work. The title of my presentation today is A Critical Review on Changing Characteristic of Japan's Development Assistance and Some Response of Civil Society. I chose this topic because Japan's foreign policy is now at a major turning point. As you know, the Ukraine war is now in its second year, and Israel's attacks on the past time, uh, Gaza Strip, since October last year, have already resulted in may, more than 30,000 civilian casualties, including many children and women. However, there is no end in sight for ceasefire of those wars. As a citizen living in Japan, I can help little people. Uh, I, I can I can help people little there who are suffering from the war. But I have to have a strong interest in what kind of diplomacy, diplomatic stance Japan should take, particularly when the world becomes increasingly divided. By the way, what about ordinary citizens in Japan? How much interest do they have? what is going on outside Japan, even those wars. As you may know, in today's Japan, there are many problems inside the country, such as the issue of suspicion of party ticket and political donations among the Liberal Democratic Party, LDP, or they may have more concerns about familiar issues such as work style reform, and then have little time to pay attention to what is going on in foreign countries and international issues, except a baseball player, Mr. Shohei Otani. Um, but still, I have a strong sense of crisis in the world, as well as in Japan. Especially with the long-term Liberal Democratic Party administration, Japan may be turning into a so-called normal country, capable of war, and neglecting its pacifist, pacifist constitution, which emphasizes non-war principle and thus is one of the most valuable in the world, I suppose. I have a rather critical view on what my government is doing. This may be because I wear two hats, as my friend the Shiva Sensei introduced. I wear two hats. One is a university teacher, and the other one is an NGO activist. Before I became a university teacher, I worked for an international corporation humanitarian NGO for nearly 20 years, as a staff member. With these capacities, I used to visit many conflict areas such as Cambodia, Afghanistan, Iraq, East Timor, and Sudan, and others. And I often saw real aspects of conflict with my own eyes. Therefore, I probably know the reality of war from those experiences a little bit more than average Japanese citizens and how I have strong sense of no war and aversion to conflict. Another reason why I have interest in issue of war and peace because of my second hat as a university teacher. I am interested in education and how education may influence the future of Japanese society. Many of you here today, particularly those who have traveled from abroad and lived in Japan for a certain period, may share my understanding that Japanese society is less individualistic compared to the other countries. And Japanese people are struggling with strong peer pressure of society, so-called docha shiroku in Japanese. What concerns me is that if a country like Japan, which has already strong peer pressure in society, becomes a normal country capable of going to war, it is likely to fall into the totalitarianism that existed before and during the World War II. And if that happens, there would be an extremely high possibility that Japan would once again come back to a militaristic state. As I will explain later today, our government is trying to relax some important foreign and security policies to regulate weapons such as the three principles of arms and defense so that Japan may become capable of exporting weapons. In my presentation, I argue that 
Even the Official Development Assistance, ODA, which is supposed to help people on the ground, would be a part of foreign and state security policies and leads to our country to take steps towards making weapons and exporting to other countries. I also would like to argue that this would inevitably affect the state of the domestic society as well, and the society would emerge that controls individuals under strong peer pressure and surveillance and suppresses freedom of individuals, such as freedom of speech and political action for the sake of protecting national security. Sorry. A few days ago, I found a small articles in the Asahi Shimbun. The headline of the article reads as follows. No two war is political. A long established cafe in Shinjuku station where a poster with no war message was removed. The article continues. The message of war is over if you want it is taken from the lyrics of Happy Christmas, a song by John Lennon and Yoko Ono, said to express the anti-Vietnam war sentiment. But at the coffee shops in the Shinjuku station, when customers saw the posters, they claim that the food is delicious, but I don't like that idea posted on them. And also the station building management company said that they often received complaints from customers saying it's too political. Nowadays in Japan, there seems to be some people who think that expressing to be opposed to war is an ideology. And in order to express his or her ideology in public, we have to be careful about choosing a place. Otherwise, it is regarded as a not good social behavior because it will make people who do not sympathize with ideology uncomfortable. Ideas should be kept in heart and mind and asserting them would be infringing on the idea of others. So this could be against a society that respects diversity. Therefore, it seems that more and more people are thinking that they should refrain from asserting their own idea in public. You may be familiar with this book, Matan Brown, or Brown Morning by Frank Pavlov. It depicts how society becomes infected with totalitarianism while allowing small changes in order to avoid trouble. I feel a sense that similar crisis is happening in this society, Japan, today. As you know, ideology and the politics are connected. Some classic book says war exists as an extension of politics. Then the opinion of against war has to be political implying to criticize certain political administration or the government. You may agree that expressing a political opinion should be allowed as a political right in the democratic countries. What we observe here is that Japan is a society that values self-reliance for the sake of the society, so they oppress each other before being oppressed by the government and those in power. There is a proverb in Japan that says, if you open your mouth, your lips will get cold. You should not express your opinion in public as it may create peer pressure on others, but you can also hear different voices that says, you can say it, but don't be too insistent. You, choose, you should respect the value of other opinions. What is weird here is that a world of diversity becomes another peer pressure to conform in the modern Japanese society now. Then you fall into double bind that is a situation in which you are confronted with two irreconcilable <coughs> demands. Okay, so I should stop here because I got sidetracked a little bit too much. Now I'd like to get back to the my main topic, the uh, development assistance. Firstly, I would like to briefly explain why we discuss ODA and the international cooperation policies in order to examine Japan's foreign and security policies. You are probably aware that security involves two kinds of power. 
One is the hard power of the military and armed forces to control tension and relaxation. And the other is soft power of the economy and culture to promote connections and understanding. After the World War II or the Asia-Pacific War, Japan has been ex exercising its diplomatic and security policy based on the pacifist constitution for nearly half a century with a focus on soft power rather than hard power. Of course, I'm aware, I'm aware that there is an argument that this single line security was only allowed in Japan where there are U.S. military bases centered on Okinawa under the protection of U.S. hard power. However, it is also true that Japan's security to some extent has been possible because its soft power was well received by many countries. In this strong context, Japan's ODA has played a relatively important role as a part of foreign policies. In fact, looking at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs budget, nearly half of it is accounted for by ODA-related budgets. As you see in the slide, in fiscal year 2023, 315.3 billion yen is directly related to ODA out of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs overall budget of 756 billion yen, including contribution to international organizations such as the United Nations. The total amount ODA related will rise to the 466.4 billion yen, which is more than half of the overall budget of Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So it is easy to understand why the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is so eager to increase the ODA budget. However, it is not just about the budget why I want to discuss Japan's foreign and security policies by looking at ODA. It is rather because I believe that the issue of ODA is not only important for the Japan's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but is closely related to each of us as it affects the formation of Japanese society. Then let us look at the characteristic of so then let's, let us look at the characteristic of Japan's ODA. Characteristics of Japan's ODA include many aspects, such as it historically originated from the post-war reparations, that is an uh, obligation of defeated country of Asia-Pacific War. Second, Japan's ODA's regional focus is Asia, because it worked for the building of vertical integration in Asia in the Cold War structure under the U.S. security strategy. It is also said that the high up saving rate of Japanese people is behind the fact that Japan's ODA are more loans, yen loans, rather than grant aid. Fourth, projects of Japan's aid tends to be construction of large-scale economic infrastructure because they helped Japanese company expand overseas. While mentioning these characteristics, for, today, for today's discussion, however, I would like to focus on another fact that Japan's ODA has no legal basis. It is true that Japan's ODA is a pillar of its foreign policy and uses a large amount of the annual budget to nearly one trillion yen, but there is no basic law, like the basic law, basic labor law, or the basic act on education. I'm aware that even some of the other donor countries do not have a basic law, so it is not necessarily necessary, but as a domestic, uh, as a democratic country, in my opinion, Japan should have the basic law because if it has legal basis, it becomes possible to thoroughly discuss the content of ODA and its policies and the budget in the diet. And I also believe that the basic law is necessary to ensure transparency and accountability. Spe speaking retrospectively, this debate has used to happen in 70s and 80s before the first ODA charter created in 1992. As I remember, nearly 10 times, including season legislation, bills were proposed, but all of them were crushed by the combined efforts of the Liberal Democratic Party and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs at the time. Then instead, we, have, we now have the Charter, 
as the highest level policies of ODA. Then I have to also point out that the charter is a policy that is formulated by cabinet decision of the current administration, and thus it was not discussed in the diet. It is not legally binding, that I think makes ODA so distant from the people. Then there is a question you may ask, why do you Japanese people allow to spend nearly 10,000 yen per person on ODA? Then my answer would be, if you need uh, any legitimate reason for its existence, it is found in the preamble of the Japanese constitution. Let me read what is written there. It says, we, the Japanese people, desire peace for all time and are deeply conscious of the high idea of controlling human relationship. And we have determined to preserve our security and existence, trusting in the justice and the faith of the peace loving people of the world. We desire to occupy an honored place in an international society, striving for the preservation of peace and the banishment of t- tyranny and slavery, oppression and intolerance for all time from the earth. We recognize that all people of the world have the right to live in peace, free from fear and want. It it explicitly states the right of peaceful existence, and it is a law of the nation of Japan to cooperate and strive to ensure that all people in the international community secure the right to live in, live from, from, live fr- free from fear and deprivation. Here you may already notice that this is the uh, same as what we now call human security. Therefore, it can be said that Japan's ODA essentially has its notion of pursuing human security in it. In fact, the idea of human security is often expressed both directly or indirectly in the ODA Charter and the Development Cooperation Charter, though they are formulated in place of the basic law. Now let's, look, now let's take a look at what the ob- objectives and the philosophy of aid expressed in the ODA Charter and examine how human security has been treated with, the, with them. To conclude first, in the last year's revision, there was a, there was a major revision last year of ODA, Charter. There was a major shift in Japan's aid policy up until now, as it makes possible to provide aid to the military. And I'm afraid that it would consequently devalue the idea of human security, which is making its meaning more and more empty and less significant. What concerns me is that it would result in making increasingly difficult to eliminate the insecurity of vulnerable people on the ground. Um, uh, Since Japan's ODA charter was first formulated in 1992, it has been revised three times in 2003, 2015, and the last year in 2023. But uh, I think for the interest of time, uh, I would like to skip this slide. Um, but please keep in your mind um, that uh, there are always uh, reason behind the division. <laughs> so I have to now talk about uh, the, the last year's uh, revision of the ODA Charter. Now, we are here to discuss the third and the last revision of the charter last year. According to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Japan, there were three reasons as background of the formulation for revision. First, we are facing complex crisis. Second, we need to consider impacts of emerging donors and need to address the issue of transparent and fair rules. And third, how we co- cooperate with diverse actors and mobilizing new funds. It seems that these are the reasonable understanding of the international situations in general, but different interpretation would be also possible 
if you put them in a more specific context of current international politics. For example, the complex crisis or compound crisis, including challenge to the free and open international order and the deepening risk of division, implies Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Ukraine, and the tense relationship between China and Southeast Asia countries over the Spratly Islands. It is also obvious that emerging donors who do not follow the transparent and fair rules means China, as she is expanding its hegemonic, hegemonic influence through delivering aid as named the One Belt, One Road initiatives. Furthermore, it is also considered that aid funds should be used as a catalyst for building a regional security system in which diverse actors cooperate to control with a particular group of countries while consolidating ties with developing countries, particularly Asian countries, so that Japan's nation's national interests are secured. This is a strategy used of the ODA in the sense of MOFA. However, to me, this strategic and diplomatic use of ODA for security seems similar to those of the pre-war colonialism that are promoted under the name of the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere. I think it is more clearly observable when you look at the purpose of the new outline. It says the goal is to actively contribute to the formulation of peaceful, stable, and re reflective international society based on the equal partnership with developing countries, and at the same time to promote peace for our country and its people. It is also clearly stated that we must contribute to the realization of national interests, such as ensuring security and realization, realization uh, and, sorry, realizing further prosperity through economic growth. Um, I think the time is running out, so I have to skip some slides. And then, um, I have, then I want to mention about a new framework of aid, which is called OSA. Besides the revision of ODA, the government made another cabinet decision to create a new aid framework, that is officer security assistance. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs explained the establishment of ODA on its website as follows. In order to create a desirable security environment for Japan, which is currently facing the more, more severe and complex security environment in the post-war era, it is necessary to not only fundamentally strengthen Japan's own defense capabilities, but also to strengthen the security capability and the deterrent capabilities of like-minded countries. In order to achieve these objectives, in addition to ODA for the economic and social development of different countries, the military and other organizations introducing a new grant aid framework provide equipment and develop infrastructure in response to the security needs of like-minded countries. It is also said that this will be included in the national security strategy, meaning it will form part of Japan's broader security policies. Thus, OSA is a bridge of, to control defense policy for Japan by the Ministry of Defense with, and ODA policy of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs so that it creates a broadly integrated security policy. Then ODA will inevitably be redirected from aid that responds to people's need on the ground to the foreign, from, from that of, to the foreign and security policy oriented of Japan. So in this response to this new and aid scheme, Civil Energy jointly issued a statement opposing the establishment of OSA because of the following concern. Japan may abandon the non-military principle and lose credibility as a peaceful nation. Second, joining the struggle for the hegemony and escalating international tensions. Third, while the export of weapons may strengthen the base of the defense industry in Japan, it leads to military expansion in the world. There is no debate in the diet 
actually, and there will be no monitoring in the future. Um, so I think the time is running out. So, um, so overall, there are concerns that Japan will abandon the asset of its peace diplomacy, encourage division and the militarization of the international community, and reduce democracy to a mere facade. So some of you may say that this NGO's voices is naive and unfounded or not realistic. It may indeed be unfounded. However, it is also not certain and unfounded that this will not promote military uh, armament or less transparency in the world. I don't think, I don't like to imagine this would go to the extent of neglecting the soft power of peace and humanitarian aid, uh, so neglecting peace and humanitarian aid, which has been the pillar of Japan's diplomacy up until now. Today, in the interest of time, I should stop here, but to conclude my speech, I would like to share with, uh, with you two uh, comments uh, relating to today's discussion. The first is to question whether the discourse aimed at stopping the escalation of violence by the military is still valid or not, or is it already dissolving? It has been discussed among researchers of international law and peace studies that the discourse of, that uh, peace discourse that are supposed to re regulate the use of force, such as international law and the ethics of humanitarianism are falling back as a face of modern conflict changes. The meaning of international law of war, especially the norms of engagement, has been significantly transformed by the war on terror, a war on terror discourse after 9-11, blurring the distinction between enemy and criminals. That is the basis of modern legal humanity. And also Israel's attack on the Palestine people without a state were already that they already like that, ignoring the principle of distinct distinction between combatants and non-combatants, as well as between battlefields and civilian zones, which is the basis of international humanitarian law that regulates the use of force. War is no longer a strict legal term, but is used ex exclusively in political or journalistic context and has come to be foreground as a general term representing exceptional situations. It is a psychological and a collective mechanism that justify the use of force. And it is taken for granted that it violates the private rights of citizens. International community falls into allowing the interpretation, this interpretation, that member of armed groups becomes targets of attack, even if they are not continuously engaged in the hostilities. And it has become clear that there are structural limits to the reg regulation of force. So thinking what to do about this dissolving peace discourse is a very difficult but important task that must be addressed. Second, this is the last one. There is a need to seriously discuss the issue of elimination of public insecurity, public insecurity, which is the central subject of human security. We live in a world that is volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. The reality of this world creates division between those whose security is guaranteed and those who are not by the same state and the same market. Under these circumstances, it is no longer sufficient for us to simply discuss security by considering only the safety of certain people. As the Ministry of Foreign Affairs rightly wrote when, resolving, when revising ODA, we are facing a compound crisis. To overcome this compound crisis, it is necessary to ensure that both those who live safely and those who live insecure can enjoy security together. And I think we need to fundamentally reconsider the common causes of insecurity for both. And in order to achieve this, I believe that we need radical conscientization of people. In particular, I believe 
we need conscientization of people who are already enjoying living safely, like us. Therefore, education is important. And I now start, uh, and, and now I personally started the reading of a classic book by the power of writers, which is titled Pedagogy of the, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Okay, thank you very much for your listening. Thank you very much, Professor Takashi.